So uh, I'm Steve Tallhurst from Texas Back Institute. I'll be talking about uh, kind of my journey in terms of how I like to get lateral access, uh, moving from what I initially used and, and why I like uh, kind of a two-blade model and what I think the advantages are there. Um, uh, in terms of my background, um, currently I'm a busy lateral surgeon. It's probably one of, if not the most common procedure I do. Um, and, and, you know, I'll tell you, I, I did zero of these in uh, training and in fellowship. Um, but when I got to practice, I had partners doing them and I could really see the benefits of them. And I thought it was a, a nice procedure I wanted to be able to offer my patients, but, you know, didn't really know how to do them. And my experience is watching someone do them, you know, it's kind of a small, narrow channel and there's really no substitute for being trained on them and doing them yourself. So went to San Diego, got what I thought was pretty good training with Nuvasiv, started doing them, started doing more and more as I got more comfortable with it. And, you know, it was, it was a retractor that worked well in my hands that I was, you know, pretty comfortable with and certainly was what I got trained on. Um, as I used it more and as I started expanding my indications for lateral, I started getting some issues with it. You know, it, it worked pretty well, but I felt, you know, the retractor was a little bit bulky. I got kind of sick of the table mount and poking my assistant in the gut all the time. Um, sometimes I'd go down and get a really clean look at the disc, but other times, you know, you'd be seeing psoas in there and you're trying to take these little shims down and tuck the psoas out. And I felt like I was manipulating the psoas a little bit more that way. Um, as I started doing more of these and they have 26 millimeter implants and you're working on patients with bigger bones or osteoporotic patients, trying to get the biggest possible footprint in that I could became more important to me. And so, you know, when you're doing a circular dilation, you know, when you're trying to really put a 26 millimeter implant in, then you're really making a larger circular dilation in the psoas to try to accommodate that implant. And then, you know, in terms of my experience with it, in terms of fixating it to the patient, you know, what I felt was that I would notice when I, during the case, I would have this kind of gradual retractor creep anteriorly where, you know, my, my trial looked pretty okay and my, my implant looked all right, but the implant would seem a little more anterior than my trial was and where I initially docked. And that, that may have been really good for lordosis, but it was, you know, bad for my blood pressure. So um, I also had some concerns about putting a posterior shim down as my fixation. You know, that you're putting a kind of a sharp thing down near all the stuff they tell you you need to worry about. And you're putting it uh, near the frame, near the plexus. And then you're making your annulotomy toward your fixation. So I think some of those are also reasons why things can, you know, can slightly creep anteriorly. Didn't have any disasters, but you know, at the same time, it was just something I noticed. Um, and then I think increasingly, you know, several systems, you know, the striker system, the D-lift system from Medtronic, you know, they're saying, well, why don't you just anchor to like one vertebral body? And you know, I tried those, and I found that it really did give me added stability, especially at two, three with the ribs, four, five with the crest. I noticed that that, that seemed to be pretty nice, and so putting a pin into one vertebral body didn't seem so crazy. And so as I was doing with these, I was talking with my friend, Dr. Herod, and kind of talking through, you know, what's working well, what's not. And he said, well, I'm, you know, I've got this other retractor I've used. It's two blades, a little different. Maybe look at that. And I said, yeah, maybe it's a good idea, maybe not. You know, and I kind of kept doing what I was doing. Um, but what I really ended up wanting was something where I felt like I was obviously causing less uh, trauma to the psoas. The retractor was less bulky. I didn't want to feel like it was going to migrate on me. I really wanted to look down and see clean white disc the first time, you know, and not have to move things around because that's retractor time in the psoas. And then I wanted to be able to make small adjustments to the retractor position easily that would stay there permanently. And then in terms of the implant, which is really something other than this discussion, but I prefer to bulleted tip implant. Uh, you know, I, I like bulleted tip trials as I was doing more of these patients with uh, asymmetric collapse, degenerative uh, scoliosis getting that implant and that retractor in, you know, without bludgeoning up the end plates where you're going in or having to put shims in, having to put slides in to get your implant in was something that I, I really started to feel was advantageous. And so the two blade retractor was something I started looking at. Um, and, you know, I was pretty resistant to it initially. You know, it looked very different and I had them bring it by and I said, you know, this is the K2M retractor that I had started using. And, you know, I said, you know, I had all these issues. I was like, is this robust enough? It looks kind of small compared to some of the other retractors I've seen. I said, you know, what protects me in the front and in the back? You know, you'll have muscle on both sides potentially and, and bad stuff. And then, you know, you're fixating with fixation pins. So I said, you know, well, what about the segmentals? Am I gonna hit those? What about bone bleeding? Am I gonna have a hematoma there? If you use infuse, are you gonna have a bunch of heterotopic ossification? If you have uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, if you have some blood leaking out? 
And then, you know, importantly also, you know, if I'm trialing and it's a tight disk space and I'm going in and out with the trials, you know, is this thing going to pull out in an osteoporotic patient? And then you've got, you know, kind of a bloody mess where you're trying to get back in and you've got half your, annual, you know, half your discectomy done. Um, but, you know, I, 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 the more and more I thought about it, I said, oh, I'll, I'll try one. I'll try one at 3-4. And so I tried it, and what I ended up really liking, and I think the thing that was the biggest, uh, the biggest for me was, I got great disc visualization from the outset. Went in, in line with the psoas, twisted it, and then I could really just see disc. The retractor's fixated to the patient, it's not gonna move. I never had an issue where the implant's more anterior than I expected. Um, I like not having a table mount, um, you, know, I, you know, in orthopedics, I think we always go in line with the muscle, and I think this just made more sense to me about going in line with the fibers of the psoas, twisting. Um, I think circumferential dilators and tubes can be great, but this just made more sense to me in terms of how we approach other things in orthopedics all over the body. Um, and then I also like that I could dock where monitoring is best. I actually tend to dock more in the front, especially at four or five, and I liked being able to dock in the front and be able to swing the retractor around and push everything back. And I think in the area of being, in the area of being cost conscious, you know, I. I didn't really, this didn't occur to me when I was initially doing these cases, but, you know, every time I popped open one of these NVM things with the disposable lights and all that, I mean, that's, that's a disposable, that's added cost. I think in my hospital, it's like 1200 bucks. You know, you might get it cheaper some places and it could easily be more expensive other places. But, you know, when you're looking at these patients, I mean, that, that's a pedicle screw and a half that, you know, is just because you used one retractor system over another. So I liked having really minimal to no disposables. And I loved a lot more stuff than I hated, but you know, I, I felt like when I, looked at, uh, when I looked at this through the retractor, the x-ray visualization, especially the vertebra, could have been better on this tube blade. I thought the retractor architecture could be more open. I thought it could be simpler. Um, but overall, I think the tube blade model for me was a game changer. With the, the clean disc prep, I liked having three channels in the blade that would let me make a like three millimeter adjustment forward or backwards, depending on where I slid the retractor down the K-wire. I liked controlled dilation of just distracting one blade at a time, uh, especially with DGEN Scolies, it really, really could let you choose where you want it to dock very precisely. Um, and then as, as uh, Dr. Harrod said, you know, if the retractor fits as a 24 millimeter blade, it took a lot of the guesswork out. I mean, if, if a 24 looks good, you know, front to back on that vertebra, the 22 is going in, and if it looks small, you know you can get a 26 in. There's just no, no guesswork there. And you don't have to dilate the retractor more because with, with architecture being open on the front and the back, you know, you can make a little more annulotomy with a kerosene and you can get your 26 in. But like a lot of things, you know, I thought, could this be better? You know, Blockbuster was great. You got movies, but I think we all agree that, you know, the streaming services are a game changer for us. And so we started exploring that and saying, you know, could, could, we, make, could we make this better? And, you know, this is what we came up with. So... This is a retractor that we've been working on for a long time. Keeps the benefits of a two-blade retractor. Um, over on the side, you can't really see it, but there's a, an area where you can mount it to the table if you want, okay? Um, uh, and really what we wanted was to have as much radiolucency as we could to see the vertebra uh, and, and the anatomy as well as, as possible. Uh, we made a C shape instead of an H shape, just less, less around where you're working. Um, and it's less retractor body that's gonna hit the ribs or the crest. Um, the blades are aluminum, which are more radiolucent and taper down to be really narrow at the tips. And then the carbon fiber body, aside from looking kind of cool, um, is very robust and it's very radiolucent. So you don't have any metal really around there that impinges on your view of the vertebra. And additionally, you know, we said, let's make some bulleted implants that are HAP that use, you know, what we think is really good technology that certainly worked well on ALIF and PLIF that, you know, we've heard about from other presenters. So this is kind of the front and the side view of it. You can see how it tapers down. It's really a minimal footprint. You're not having this, you know, you're not having a behemoth in there. Um, and then I, I think what I liked about it is we, you can use what you need. In my hands, you know, I, when I initially used a two-blade retractor, I liked, okay, we can put an anterior blade, a posterior blade on there. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, I never need an extra blade. But if you want it, it's there. If you feel more comfortable with a posterior blade, and with a, that's a blunt shim, there's actually gonna be a sharp shim. If you want that, you can, you can put that in there and you can add it on, but it's certainly not something you need. Um, you can add an anterior blade with that little outrigger there. It snaps on very easily. 
In my experience, about 90% of the time, I never need them using a two-blade retractor. The, the exception to that rule is either in a really obese patient or more commonly when they get kind of light on the anesthesia, they start coughing and all I see is retroperitoneal fat. And in that case, it's very easy to just clip on a retractor and it's not something that goes all the way down to the psoas. Normally, I just dock shallow with it. It just pushes the, the retroperitoneal fat out of the way and then you can finish the case. You don't need to take the retractor in and out. What does it look like in practice? So I think you know, what we wanted to design again was something you could see very easily through. And this is our attractor in, in, in a cadaver, but you, know, you can see that you get great visualization through those carbon fiber uh, arms. You have only one uh, metal area in the back. So really you get very minimal uh, um, you know, impingement on what you, can, what you wanna be able to see uh, on the anatomy. Um, you really can see very well where you are front to back on that vertebra. Um, and then, you know, the, what I do with these is, you know, I look, at the tr I look at the retractor blade, but I think the trial really dictates, you know, what more I do. So if I put a 22 in and it's toward the back, I know I don't have to dilate more. I just put my Fraser tip in, push a little bit of psoas out of the way, take a kerosene and bite some more annulus. And, you know, I, I know in invasive training, they, they had told me, you know, like never, never bite anteriorly, don't do that. But once I, once I have the comfort of knowing anatomically where I am, I feel like I can do a much more aggressive discectomy, not just perform a channel discectomy, but really say, okay, if I'm toward the back, I can take an angled curette and really get out a lot of disc moving toward the front and feel very comfortable that I'm not, you know, taking on added risk for that patient, but really doing a better disc prep to either get the implant in a better position or get a better fusion rate for them. Um, and you don't have to do any additional dilation for that. So in terms of the concerns that I had with this, you know, I, I've done over 500 levels with, uh, you know, with a lateral retractor for a lot of indications. L4-5 is the most common level I've done. Um, I really haven't had much in the way of pin site bleeding. You know, I've used a bipolar occasionally when I've had some bleeding there, but uh, you know, I did that before I used this retractor. Typically, I take flow seal on a long, um, a little long cannula and put it under the retractor blades and hold, you know, put a sponge stick pressure on there for five seconds before I pull the retractor out. Um, I really haven't had much in the way of pin pull out. You're, you know, the retractor's really, uh, cephalad and caudal to where your uh, trials are. So I really haven't seen that be an issue. And then in terms of retractor strength, I think one thing to mention is, you know, before I put a fixation pin in, I slide a neuromonitoring probe down there and stimulate to make sure I'm not putting, you know, putting a pin in anything that's not good that I can't see. You know, I've had a handful of cases where I put, you know, the pin in at four and it tested, you know, good. And at five, it's been six or something like that. And I haven't been quite happy with it. And so I've just left one pin in there and that's been sufficient to do the case. So, you know, one pin has been, has been enough for me. I've really never seen a segmental uh, with this approach and I haven't had an injury. And I think the other, the other thing that, you know, was certainly my biggest concern using is, you know, am I gonna cut the psoas or cut the plexus with it not having a posterior blade? I think, you know, for me, having that 24 millimeter retractor, it really does protect you because you can see where you're at. Um, you know, you can put a posterior blade in. I use a Fraser tip during my annulotomy. I just pull back on the psoas. That protects me and keeps the area dry as well. And I think as surgeons, you know, the other thing is like, just don't cut bad stuff. I mean, every time you do an A-lift, you got to look at the vessels and not cut the vein. Every time you do a T-lift, you look at that exiting root and you say like, don't cut that. So, you know, I, I think that it, it's not as big of an issue as people think. But, I mean, I think in, in summary, you know, I was a skeptic of this. It took me a while to come around, but I'm happy I did. I think there's some subtleties to this, and I think really, in my opinion, try it once or twice. Try an L3-4 and you know, see, what you, see what you think with hands-on experience. But for me, trying one or two of these really, it was quickly a game changer for me. Thank you.